All right, everybody, we're going to get started as more people join. We'll be able to uh, hear everything, all the exciting stuff that we're talking about. So welcome to today's webinar. And just as a side note, as we all work from home, as we social distance uh, during these calls, you may hear some background noise on, on my behalf or one of the other speakers. Um, that's just something in the world we're living in today. So please bear with us with that. Um, we also understand that you have lots going on and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today on this extremely important topic in our industry today. We all take pride in our restaurants and the kitchens we work in and cleanliness has always been something that we do as part of our jobs and something we take pride in. But something now cleaning is gonna be something that the customers have at the forefront of their mind. We have a couple specialists today and experts in the field they are gonna talk us through some really important information that we all need to be aware of, product recommendation, outbreak prevention measures, and so much more. Joining us today, we have Jim, who is from uh, Diversity. He's our Senior Clinical Advisor, Infection Prevention at Diversity. We also have a special guest joining us from Diversity as well, Shu Hall, who's their Corporate Accounts Manager, who has joined us. Thank you both. We also have Melissa from Gordon Food Service. She's our North American Senior Legal Counsel and be, will be answering and giving us some very important information uh, when it comes to things that we need to think of right now. So with that, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in, into the question box. We will answer them as we go and at the end of the webinar. So please, as they come to your mind, just go ahead and type them in and we'll make sure we cover them off for you. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jim. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brett. Um, I just will share my screen here, which should just take half a second to come up. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'm excited to be able to talk to this group of people and share some expertise around where we are at. Uh, what I want to do is uh, start with some objectives as to where we are. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing uh, the new virus as soon as I get the slide to catch up to me here. There we go. Uh, discuss the new virus. Uh, talk about aspects of surface disinfection and sanitizing, where we need to focus on this for sure, and where I think we need to head in the future. So I know everybody online, one of your prime concerns is to provide the safest environment for your customers and also for your staff. I think this virus has showed us what can happen when we get a virus into a uh, immune uh, naive population is the uh, fancy way of saying we've never seen this before. And certainly everyone online wants to protect their brand reputation. You do not want to be uh, the media darling on the front page of the newspaper or the headline on the 24 hour news show at as having had a problem. That's never good for your brand reputation. Uh, prior to this outbreak of viral respiratory diseases, most restaurants or food service industry, people that make it into the news is usually through food poisoning, bad bean sprouts or contaminated lettuce, things like that. This is a new era that we're in and we wanna make sure that we're not gonna make the news by doing something wrong. We wanna make the news by doing stuff right. So I've got a few slides here just on some of the terminology and some of the principles that I work in as an infection control practitioner. Most of my career has been spent in healthcare. I have consulted with all manners of areas where care are provided. And I've also been a fast food worker back in my teenage years. So I appreciate the importance of providing good food. I think the first thing to take away is you have to clean before you disinfect or sanitize. We can't sanitize or disinfect dirt. It's just not possible to do it. Our products are not made for that. What I'm gonna emphasize through this presentation is we have to appreciate what the contact time is for the product that we're using. And we'll have more on that as we go through the presentation because every product has a specified wet contact time to achieve the kill claims that you think are happening. So if you're using a 10 minute product that say is a quaternary ammonium based compound or what I call quats, if it's a 10 minute product on the label, you have to keep the surface wet for 10 minutes to achieve whatever that label said you were doing. If it's a sanitizer at 10 minutes, then you gotta wait 10 minutes. If it's a disinfectant at 10 minutes, you're gonna to have to wait 10 minutes to get that disinfection. Sanitizing claims generally are shorter, and I'll talk about that in terms of how we get the designation of a sanitizer. 
Another definition I use a lot is because we have to clean before we disinfect, that's just basically removing junk from a surface. So you're getting rid of the dirt, food particles and stuff like that using a combination of water and detergents uh, and some elbow grease. This is the other thing that is vitally important in good cleaning and disinfection is making sure that you have the elbow grease, that pressure on a surface to perform the actual cleaning step. And I've stated this already, it has to be done before any kind of disinfection or sanitizing is happening. We don't banter around the word decontamination too much outside of healthcare because uh, it basically just means you make it clean. Disinfection is where we use a chemical to eliminate most or all microorganisms except those hard to kill things such as spores. And it's usually done with liquid chemicals or heat. So disinfection, I'm not going to get into the high, intermediate, and low levels. Most of what we're looking at when we talk about a disinfectant in the food industry is low-level disinfection. But we're trying to achieve a six log, which is just a way of talking about the kill. Think of it as 99.9999% kill. Uh, log relates to the number of nines quite nicely, by the way. So sanitation or sanitizer it's a reduction in microorganisms, but not to the extent of disinfection. So a non-food contact registered sanitizer, we have to submit that we can kill three log microorganisms, usually in under five minutes in Canada. And if it's a food contact surface sanitizer, to get that designation, we have to show efficacy of being able to kill 99.999 or five log bacteria on a surface in under 30 seconds. That's how we get the designation. So there are set standards in Canada on registering. It's, the document's actually called Disinfecting Drugs, uh, but it covers disinfectants and sanitizers. Pasteurization, you will all be familiar from this when we pasteurize our milk so that we don't end up with other problems uh, in our uh, cheeses or milk. Uh, it's where we heat something up rapidly to a high temperature and then cool it again. And again, it's generally used in uh, food processing for things like milk. So what are we all facing here? Hopefully none of this is new news for you. Uh, the virus that has showed up has been designated as severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus number two, SARS-CoV-2. The disease that it causes, COVID-19, is a contraction of coronavirus disease 2019. It is not the 19th coronavirus, uh, as I've heard on some of our media to the south of us here. It's actually the seventh coronavirus that has been recognized at causing illnesses in humans. It is human to human spread. Uh, we've got a little bit of evidence that we can spread it to our cats at home or we've spread it to larger felines. Uh, there is some evidence that minks and ferrets, which are all part of the feline family, can also acquire the organism. We don't know if they can give it to us. Uh, stay tuned for that. My daily update, uh, because I'm responsible to diversity to be their infection control practitioner, so I use the Worldometers site, uh, and every time you refresh it, it gives you the current status worldwide on the number of cases by country, the number of deaths, the cumulative total of that, uh, and then it also breaks it down into the number of tests done, and it also gives you the rates of testing and the rates of, or the death rate per million population. So you can compare how countries are faring against each other, not that it's a competition, but it can put it into perspective as to what we're seeing. ProMed there is a, a medical site that will send you an email two to three times a day about infectious diseases around the world. Uh, and it calls it from newspapers and other media presentations, but they have moderators that will talk about the science behind it. So uh, today already I've had two updates from ProMed on what's happening worldwide with COVID, new research that's coming out because they also will keep an eye on the medical journals. We've also got the Public Health Agency of Canada, which all of you should have bookmarked. Uh, it's got great information in all aspects of healthcare. I just found out I can sign up to get an email whenever they update something on the website so I don't have to keep going back to it. The World Health Organization is great too. Uh, they are constantly putting out new documents and updating their documents to let us know what we should be doing. So this virus, the SARS-CoV-2, um, from a microbiology perspective, which is my background, it's an enveloped virus, which as uh, common sense as it may seem, that actually means they're very easy to kill because the envelope is made out of fat or lipids, and that's easy to attack. 
The non-envelope viruses are the ones that are very, very difficult to kill. And we are very, very thankful in the infection control world that SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus and not a non-envelope virus. So we know it's spread by contact. So if you come in contact with a soiled surface and then touch something, uh, what I usually refer to as your eyes, nose, or mouth, or the T-zone, which is what that picture is there, you're going to take the virus from a surface and touch yourself. So these are the surfaces that we're trying to focus on as I go through this presentation that we may need to pay closer attention to. The droplet spread is something that we have found out now uh, that we know it is spread by droplets. Uh, large droplets that are going to go that um, one to two meters when we're coughing, sneezing, or talking. And that's where the uh, recommendations that I'm talking about soon here uh, around wearing a mask when you're out in public is so that if you have the virus in your respiratory secretions, you're not going to share it through coughing, clearing your throat, or talking. So the outbreak, um, I've done this presentation a couple of times. The first time I did it was back in March 24th. And actually, I believe that was the data for Restaurants Canada. Uh, so that was pretty preliminary. Uh, then April 27th, I did an update in the square brackets. And then as of May 18th, I updated my numbers. So you can see the infections worldwide went up by a factor of 10 uh, from March to April. We're now right at about 4.9 million people worldwide have tested positive. We've seen 319,000 deaths and that goes up hourly. In Canada, when I checked yesterday, we were at 5,800 deaths, just over that, at a death rate of about 155 deaths per million population. Perspective again, 70 to 80 percent of our deaths in Canada are occurring in long-term care. Uh, so it's hitting the elderly very hard that live in group settings. So that's where we're seeing a lot of the death but there are also other people that are also susceptible to it. And we're now discovering that people can be infected with this virus. They can have it in their respiratory secretions and shed it for two to three days before they show symptoms or have the virus shed it and never show symptoms. And that's the concerning part. That is where the change came from the Public Health Agency of Canada for us to put a mask on when we go out. If we have to go out, put a mask on in case you've been exposed you have it in your respiratory secretions with no signs or symptoms, and you could be spreading the virus. This is being studied constantly. We're trying to figure it out. I've seen some very preliminary papers where they've taken people's blood to see if they have the antibodies that we would form if we've been exposed. And in one study that I saw, there was a large number, like five to 10% of people had been exposed to the virus with no signs or symptoms. So this is where we're trying to take a good look at were these people infectious to other people? We don't know, probably, because the virus is there and the virus is opportunistic that way. But we're very curious as to how this is working where people can have the virus and not end up getting sick. So the range, uh, the incubation period, three to five days on average is what we're finding when we can trace back and do our contact tracing to find out who was exposed and when they uh, got exposed. The range that we're still using is one to 14 days. You're going to hear about people that test positive after that, uh, but it gets back to, again, when they were exposed, are we actually testing for live virus? As I've stated, 80% of those that have had symptoms have been very mild, where you will have a cough, fever, uh, body aches, mild illnesses are showing up in 80% of people. The risk factors are being teased out much better. Uh, I hate to see that being over 60, because I am, is one of the risk factors. But if you're over 60 with underlying medical conditions, especially high blood pressure seems to be a big one uh, that is making people very susceptible to this virus with a severe consequence. If you are obese, if you have a metabolic disorder like diabetes, any kind of lung disease or cardiovascular disease, and each one of those adds to the severity of how this virus will hit you. Uh, so there's a lot of issues around this. You can be very young, diabetic, it's going to hit you hard. You can be a very old person with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, it's going to hit you very hard. But at the same time, we have young, healthy adults that are coming down and becoming very sick with this. We're also now seeing a syndrome in children under 18 who have been exposed to the virus or was ill with the virus showing up with a uh, more severe complication a week or two or three after they've had this illness. So we're still learning about the virus. We have to be patient. Uh, I see a lot of kickback as we change our recommendations is based on the evidence that we're acquiring from it. We know the virus survives on surfaces. 
Uh, the most recent study that I saw by Van Dormelen here, uh, they in the laboratory showed that the virus survives on plastic and stainless steel for three days in their laboratory under ideal conditions, right? So it's, um, it's a surface with um, standardized humidity, standardized temperature. Uh, it's not a piece of stainless steel outside exposed to the sun. So it's ideal conditions that this thing will survive for three days on surfaces, cardboard 24 hours, copper four hours. But this is not the whole issue. I did a little experiment at home that I need to repeat, but I wanted to talk about the concept of transfer. How well does it transfer? Because if it's on a surface and we get it on our hand and touch our eye, how many viruses actually move when we do that? How dirty does the surface have to be? Or if we touch a surface that has the virus on it, get it on our hand or fingers, touch another surface, somebody else touches it and touches their eye, nose or mouth, how effective is the transfer? We don't know that, we know it survives, uh, but we're still not even quite sure how many viral particles it will take to actually give you a case of COVID. So my experiment at home was to take my finger, clean, I dipped it into some cocoa powder uh, that my wife has for baking, because uh, I don't get a chance to do any baking. But I took the cocoa powder off of my finger and I tried to make a fingerprint on a piece of white paper. And some transferred, not all of it, a bunch stuck on my finger. But then I took another clean finger onto that faint fingerprint couldn't see anything on my finger, tried to transfer it to another surface. And again, each time you do a transfer, less and less and less is transferred. Why I bring this up is to try to calm some of the panic about being out in public. It's really, you have to have a fair amount of virus that is going to be on a surface to actually touch your eye, nose, or mouth and pick it up. A lot of the transmission that we're seeing, we feel is that face-to-face -face droplet transmission. So that's when you actually have someone who has the virus and is talking to you face to face. And they could be in that pre-symptomatic period or prodromal period where they've they're actually got the virus in their secretions. And through coughing, sneezing, kissing, talking, or singing loudly, we will see the transmission. Because I'm sure many of you on your social media feeds, which I do not recommend you use to get your updated information on COVID, but you're seeing about uh, choirs that um, you know practice social distancing and still spread the virus. Uh, these are all very anecdotal until we get a good look at it and have it peer reviewed. I try not to read stuff like this until it shows up in some credible, creditable medical journals. Uh, JAMA is a good journal, The Lancet. And again, I subscribe to those to get updates as to what is coming down the road in terms of some of the present, uh, some of the papers that are coming out. So prevention in general is to keep that one to two meters from everybody, that social distancing and to wear masks in public. Those are the most current recommendations that we've got. And from what I'm understanding, if you have a mask on, you should still try to social distance. The mask is stopping you from sharing spit to susceptible people or on two surfaces. So if you have someone who doesn't have a mask on that might carry the virus, the homemade masks aren't to protect you from getting the virus coming in. It's to keep you from sharing the virus out. So if you're with someone who is not wearing a mask, that's when you want to have the social distancing. Two people with masks on are probably okay to get close to each other, but we're still just recommending let's keep up the social distancing. I don't want to get into a flow diagram of if you've got this and then this, or if you've got this and this, then you can do that. It's just too much right now. Personal protective equipment. Um, gloves are driving me nuts because I see people at the hardware store and at the nursery and at the food store with gloves on. Do not wear gloves in public. If you have to wear gloves as part of your job, wear them for what you are trained to use them for and take them off when you were done that job. My biggest problem with gloves, even in healthcare, is watching people touch themselves with gloves on. And many times you can see them thinking, I'm protected, I've got gloves on, and then they touch themselves. And that's not the purpose. Gloves, if anything, will pick up more off the environment. I sort of picture them like the flip side of a sticky note. They're gonna actually pick up more stuff. They don't repel. Uh, and if you don't know good glove etiquette, you are putting yourself at a higher risk. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to get rid of. It doesn't help when you see very famous people on TV when they do newscasts of them having their gloves on. Uh, that drives me crazy. So here are some of the best practices. Don't touch. Uh, you know, I think our society going forward from here will not do a handshake to greet each other. The elbow bump is good. A head nod is great. Wash your hands. Uh, they recommend a good 20 seconds of lathering to make sure that you have removed and or inactivated any virus that might be on your hands. Hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol is great if your hands are visibly clean. 
Hand sanitizer doesn't work on dirty hands like any other sanitizer. Frequently touched uh, objects should be cleaned and disinfected, and I'll be coming to that. If somebody has respiratory signs and symptoms, they should not be out in public. If they have to go out, to public, uh, out in public to say see their physician, they should have a mask on. And a homemade mask is fine. Even a bandana is going to limit the amount of transmission that's going on. Keeping your mouth covered when you have to sneeze or cough is so vitally important. And then the face mask if you have to go out in public at this time. So in public areas, really, we shouldn't be changing a lot. Uh, we should have been practicing this forever. I, as an infection control practitioner that now travels for a living, that's my role with diversity is to provide education in North America. It amazes me what I see. Uh, so we may increase the frequency of our practices, but a lot of what I want to point out here is that our practices have to be done perfectly and properly to make sure that we're not going to uh, create a false sense of security, really. Increasing hand hygiene, having access to disinfectant wipes, having facial tissues out. I, I love hotels that have facial tissues in the restroom uh, where I can actually get a Kleenex if I have forgotten to get some. Uh, that helps me blow my nose or clear my secretions using a tissue. Having it out is that visual commitment to public safety. I think we're going to live with having clear barriers between high use areas, so between a cashier and a customer, I can see these barriers staying. Uh, I know most public places that I'm going into, be it the liquor store or the food store, even at the garden center, there's a plastic shield up to keep the cashier away from my direct secretions, even though I had a mask on to go into it. Hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. Uh, I, I get paid really good money to tell people to wash their hands uh, all my career as an infection control practitioner. In the food setting, these are standard public health measures that everyone is trained to do. So if your hands are dirty, if you've used the toilet, if you're going to prepare food, you have to wash your hands with soap and water. If you've emptied the garbage cans, if you've been handling cash, um, if you are in a production kitchen and you have to go to another part of the building, if you've coughed or sneezed into your hands, etc., that is the hand washing with soap and water because soap and water actually removes the dirt off of your hands and the bacteria and viruses and your natural skin oils. So if you have to wash your hands a lot, you are probably going to want to make sure you also have a hand lotion so that your hands don't dry out. Alcohol-based hand rubs are great, but your hands have to be visibly clean. To me, it's ideal for customers. I would love wherever there is a touch screen that as I order my menu, of course, I don't use my fingertips. I use a knuckle off of my finger. So I don't, because I will feed myself with my fingertips and not my knuckle. Uh, I'm just aware that way. I use elbows to hit elevator buttons and all that kind of stuff too. But if I could use a touch screen and know I could sanitize my hands, uh, or if I've used a, a menu in a restaurant that was a little on the sticky side, it's nice to have a hand rub available to me. I'm not sure where we're going to end up with salad bars and buffets. That's why I put this down here if they survive. Uh, I'm really not sure uh, what the recommendations are going to be from public health officials around these common eating areas. But for sure, and this was common at my infection control conferences, there would always be a hand sanitizer at the start of the buffet line. And after I've gone through the buffet and used all of the serving utensils, I would sanitize my hands before I ate or make sure I use utensils and don't have to use my fingers to actually feed myself. So this is one area I can't really predict where we're gonna end up with it. In your food settings, we've always had standard practices that we should have been following. Um, I talked about the sanitizer, but I've had a lot of calls from people saying, does your sanitizer kill viruses? And I was surprised to learn, because I'm a healthcare kind of guy, that sanitizers do not have to be tested against viruses. For the microbiology nerds online here, we test them against gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. And as I stated earlier, we have to show an efficacy of a three log kill if it's a non-food contact surface, or if it's a food contact surface, we have to show that five log kill within 30 seconds. Disinfectants can actually kill more organisms, but depending on your disinfectant chemistry, it may take longer to kill the organisms than a sanitizer. But if the registered is a disinfectant, that's why it's so important to follow the contact time on the label. Viruses are checked at four log, that we have to show our efficacy within that label claim, bacteria at six log. That's just all the testing aspect of it. What I do want to note, and I've heard of some food service industries that are switching away from their sanitizers to use disinfectants, and I want to point out what my food scientist has indicated, that even if you use a disinfectant on food contact surfaces, you still have to follow the steps of clean the surface, rinse it off, right? So you use your soap and water and elbow grease, 
then you would apply your disinfectant, allow the contact time, and you have to rinse. There is no such thing that I'm aware of that is a no rinse disinfectant. So after you've cleaned with soap and water and rinsed, applied your disinfectant for the contact time, you have to rinse. And then by law, you still have to sanitize the surface. So to me, that's starting to get into a little bit of overkill, unless you're in a situation where there are body fluids present at back of house. So that's why I set up this slide to show the back of house where you're going to clean and utilize your sanitizers as you do for standard operating procedure. That's why they are in place. That shouldn't have to change. Where I see a disinfectant being applied as a safety measure is if you've had a known positive employee uh, where they phone in saying, hey, just found out I was positive, then you may want to consider a disinfectant at back of house. Obviously, if you've had a body fluid spill. This should apply from that rapid onset nausea and vomiting kind of thing where all of a sudden somebody is going, oh my goodness, I feel unwell and vomits. That should be cleaned up and disinfected if it's at back of house for sure. Uh, that takes care of any potential problems that are there. At front of hey, house, Jim. yes. Sorry, Jim, can I ask you a quick question? Because you mentioned it there and you provide a lot of great information. So the question coming in is um, around that sanitizer piece. And if you're going to get to it, just say, we're going to get to this and we'll carry on. Is a quat sanitizer acceptable practice for sanitizing services? Yes, with some provisios. So the issue with a quat product that uh, we've been sharing this awareness through healthcare, and I'm not sure how well it's being shared within the food industry. It depends on how you apply it to a surface because quats are the opposite charge of cotton cloths. And hence you have opposites, they attract, and the quat gets bound to the cloth. So if you're applying your quat, with, quat sanitizer with a cotton cloth, you're actually absorbing the quat out of the solution. And I've got some recommendations on that at the last slide here where we will look at different products that don't have this quat binding issue. But a quat sanitizer left on for the appropriate length of time will kill the bacteria indicated on that sanitizer. Okay, so they should be using, if they are using a quat, they should be using a different style of cloth, which you'll get to. Yes, I will. Thank you. Okay, so at front of house, this is where your public are going to be watching a lot closer to see what you have in place. Uh, and this is where I think you will win more um, good public relations by having a disinfectant at front of house, even though it's probably overkill if it is done frequently. But people will want to see you wiping down those high touch surfaces. And that's what the small uh, images on the right hand side of this are talking about. You know, your dispensers, tablets, switches, chairs, tabletops. My big bugbear all of my career traveling has always been the menus. And while I was on the road, uh, my last trip, uh, my last restaurant that I ate in in Orlando, Florida, uh, I, they had hand sanitizer as I went in. I sanitized my hands thinking, hey, good on you. Yeah, nice foam sanitizer. I did my hands. I got to my table, picked up the menu, and it was sticky. And I thought, great. I ordered my uh, two appetizers that I wanted, my scotch and soda because it had been a long day. Had a sip of my scotch, thought my food's just about ready. I went back to the front of house to the door, got more hand sanitizer to clean my hands because I had touched something. I then sat down without touching the table or the seat to keep my hands clean. And of course I had ordered finger food. Uh, I should probably know better than that. But this is another area that I think if you have laminated menus, they need to be wiped each time, uh, uh, but wiped in a manner that is gonna be effective. I did leave a slide in here on wear washing because I'm sure some of you still have dishes that you have to process and stuff. Nothing has changed with this, regardless of what is going on. Your wear washing system has been set up to provide the safest utensils and plates and uh, cooking um, pots and pans as possible. So if you are doing manual wear washing, you wanna make sure you check the chemical concentration for the sanitizing disinfecting process, which is usually the third sink. If you're using a low temperature machine washing, using a chemical as your sanitizer, make sure your levels are good on a regular basis. You want that documented. I think public health makes you do that anyways. If you're using high temperature washing, make sure that that final rinse is the right temperature to achieve the kill that you think it is being achieved. Whatever process time, Make sure the contact times are proper and that you comply with all the food safety stuff that is just normal. This hasn't changed. You want to hold your food at the right temperature. Where it does change a little bit, I think, is with the takeout and delivery. So with takeout, which a lot of restaurants were able to maintain in some cases where you have the customer comes to us, the risk is having symptomatic somebody with COVID uh, that it just wants some comfort food coming to your restaurant or those pre-symptomatic people coming in. 
And this is why we have the physical distancing, we have the barriers up, and we really want to see our customers showing up with a mask on. Uh, so that they're not contaminating or putting your employees at risk. That's also why we have the good cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfection. Now, in many cases, I feel this has gone a little overboard. One of my large chain grocery stores that shall remain anonymous uh, have barriers up at the cash that they wipe off every time uh, a customer has been through there. And it's a vertical barrier that nobody touches. You reach through it to use your pin pad. Uh, and I had a mask on. And I'm thinking, why are you wasting all this um, disinfectant to do a barrier that no one has actually touched. However, so delivery, where the food goes out to the customer, uh, when my presentation that I did for Restaurants Canada talked about, we need to get better at showing the customer that the food has not been tampered with, so it should be sealed. I suggested that when the food is packaged, it's dated and timed, so we know exactly when it went into the packaging. Because if I order something, and I know the restaurant's approximately 20 minutes away, and they tell me, you know, your food will be there in half an hour and it's an hour. I sort of want to know what's happened. You know, has it been held at the right temperature? That kind of thing would make me much more comfortable about getting product from your restaurant. Your delivery person has to be asymptomatic. If, it, if they're symptomatic at all, they should not be working that day. It's probably better for them to perform hand hygiene um, as they pick up the food and when they come back to your area. I know we are doing this all non-contact where they leave it on the doorstep, ring the doorbell and run away, so to speak. Uh, having good screening every day, um, and I've seen recommendations where you're gonna have to start taking the temperature of everybody showing up. We'll see where that pans out. Uh, temperature is sort of hit and miss for detection. A lot of it again is where have you been? Who have you been with? Anybody around you sick? So my disinfectant recommendation. So this is the disinfectant. If you're using a disinfectant, Health Canada came out and said, in order to kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you need to have a, a product that is labeled as a broad spectrum viricide. So just saying viricidal, meaning it's killing viruses, isn't good enough because you can get that claim just being able to kill easy viruses. So Health Canada says you need a harder to kill virus. Most of your store-bought brands that we're all familiar with should list either adenovirus or rotavirus as these harder to kill viruses. When you get to a hospital disinfectant, they will have hard to kill small non-envelope viruses like norovirus or rhinovirus or maybe even hepatitis A to show that efficacy of a hospital disinfectant. Now, Health Canada modified that after things calmed a little bit and said, or use a disinfectant with a claim against a specific coronavirus, such as MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, the original SARS virus, which many companies tested. And the laboratories actually recommend that we use a human coronavirus strain, 229E, which is just a standardized strain that we utilize. There is a list available at the URL there. Health Canada updates their list constantly. I know Diversity has submitted many of our disinfectants to be on the list, showing the efficacy against the harder to kill viruses. So if you are looking for a disinfectant, these are the recommendations that you should be asking your supplier for, that they're on the Health Canada list, or they meet the criteria that are listed on this slide. So my last couple of slides here are just talking about where I think we're gonna end up. You know, Nobody should have been coming to work sick. That should have been a given since day one. Um, it has driven me crazy that a lot of our, uh, in healthcare, a lot of people are permanent, part-time or casual, so they don't have benefits. So if they don't go to work, they don't get paid. And I think that's what we're seeing throughout the um, outbreak that we're close to in North America. So your staff should never come in sick. Your driver should never come in sick. And your clients should stay at home if they're unwell. Um, it used to be uh, in many parts of Asia that if you had a sore throat or a runny nose and just felt a little bit off, you put a mask on to go out. And now here we are again, where we're asking people, don't go out if you're unwell, but put a mask on if you do. Make sure that you use an effective sanitizer or a cleaner disinfectant all the time. It's the contact time that worries me. I don't want to see spray, 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 wipe, 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 wipe which is what I observe constantly. And I've stopped a couple, uh, one of them was an owner of a pizza joint that I was sitting with in Philadelphia waiting for something to eat. And he came by and went spray, 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 wipe, wipe, wipe at the table next to me that had just been vacated. I asked him for the bottle, which actually had a, a, a label on it. And I pointed out to him that what he was doing, spray, 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 wipe, 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 indicated it had to go on a clean surface. So it was a two-step process and the contact time was 10 minutes. It was a quad. 
Uh, and he had never noted this before. No one had ever told him this before. And I took my pizza and left thinking I don't want to eat in here because I had no idea what they were doing. The physical barriers, I'm not sure how this is going to end up. I think, like I said, if it's a high use area, I think these will maintain much like our sneeze guards did for salad bars and things like that, I think they're going to stay. I think we're going to all get a little bit better at having a little bit more in inventory for our cleaning and disinfecting supplies. Uh, healthcare lost on this one big time. I know after 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic that we had where this virus showed up, we all did pandemic planning. We filled up a warehouse with enough stuff that in case our drivers didn't show up for 30 days and then nobody rotated the stock and it all expired. We're still pulling masks out of pandemic supplies in North America where the elastic band has disintegrated because they're now six, seven, eight years old. So if we're going to have more stock in, we have to make sure that we do keep up the expiry on these. Um, we have to train everybody. That's mandated. That's law that you have to have your employees trained. They have to understand their WMIS or their GHS um, systems in terms of what they are working with and what the risks are inherent to them. As I said, we need to try to figure out when we can sanitize. If you're using a quat sanitizer, even if you're using a microfiber cloth, you need to check to see if you have quat binding and how quickly does that happen. And Suhail can talk about this in a, a couple of slides here, but any kind of cloth, uh, you need to check. Cotton for sure is gonna bind. So if you're using old face cloths or old towels, it's gonna bind. After that, if you get into an industrial cloth, I don't know, test it. Find out if it happens instantaneously, if it happens after five minutes, 10 minutes, or 30 minutes, especially if you soak a cloth in the solution. What is probably better is to find dry wipes that have been verified to work for disinfectants that you can add your solution to, and then you pull up like a disinfectant wipe, or buy pre-wetted, ready to use disinfectant wipes that have been tested. They're stable for a couple of years inside the container. You know that the company has tested them for whatever chemistry is in there in the cloth and you know it's not gonna cause you any trouble. Talk to your manufacturers, recommend best products. Part of my job is to answer questions mainly for healthcare, but if Suhail reaches out to me and says, can you help me with a problem like this? I've got the infection control background around some of this stuff. So we've always had standard practices within our food industry to provide the absolute best product and situation for our customers and staff. We're always gonna have new organisms. As I've said, I went through the outbreaks of multi-resistant organisms from the start with the resistant staphs and the resistant enterococci, then we had this bug with the spore, then we had SARS show up in 2003, we had H1N1 in 2009, MERS in the Middle East showed up in about 2014, and here we are in 2020 with a new virus. It's always gonna happen. Be very consistent with your cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfection practices. Make sure your staff understands the limitations of them. I think now people will finally catch on to respiratory etiquette of coughing or sneezing into your sleeve or making sure that if you do catch a cough or sneeze, immediately you go off and wash your hands or if that's not available to you, at least use some hand sanitizer. I think that kind of training is gonna be very, very good for us. Uh, I'm hoping we get back to the days when my children were in grade one and grade three, when we first moved to Kingston, Ontario, where I currently sit, and they had dad come into the classroom to teach the kids how to wash their hands. And that was using the fluorescent gel that they put on their hands. They wash with soap and water. You turn out the lights and show them with a black light. I trained these children in grade three. Uh, one of my son's classmates. I ran into her in grade six when I repeated it. I saw her as a volunteer when she was in high school. I saw her when she was in college to become a nurse. And her hand hygiene techniques, because I watched when I show people how to wash their hands, were impeccable. And that's a huge cornerstone of what we're trying to do. I'm going to turn this over to Suhail now uh, to talk a little bit about the disinfectant breakdown. All right. Thank you uh, very much, Jim. Really appreciate it. So uh, my name is Suhail Mutasib, and uh, I'm a uh, the, uh, the National Corporate Accounts uh, Manager for uh, Diversity for uh, our hospitality and food service industry. And uh, I oversee our relationship with GFS Canada across the board. Uh, so I really work very closely with GFS and helping uh, GFS help our mutual customer base, obviously. So uh, put together this little structure here because you know everybody's going to, going to ask really at the end of the day, okay, tell me what products do I need? Just tell me what I need so I can bring him in here and use them and ensure the safety of our of my customers and, and my staff. Uh, so what we kind of did was a pretty uh, kind of simple chart here that kind of gives uh, customers a good, better, best solution. Um, 
and we broke it down into disinfectant liquids, disinfectant wipes, and then hand sanitizer as well. Now, some of these products, uh, some of you guys might be uh, obviously uh, um, aware of some of these products and recognize Lysol, for example, is a very uh, uh, you know, reputable brand and, and people know this and we use it in our homes and what have you. Some of these other items you might be hearing for the first time, you might know them like, uh, like Oxivir. Oxivir is, uh, uh, is, is, is one of our uh, main disinfectants that we use at Diversity that we uh, offer to many of our customers. Um, and uh, um, you'll find a lot of these items listed on the uh, Health Canada uh, link that Jim had mentioned earlier in his presentation that lists a variety of different products from a variety of different vendors. So it's not just diversity, of course. Uh, you can um, obviously uh, filter if you want diversity products and see exactly what diversity carries and, and is uh, 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 certified by Health Canada. And of course, you can see other vendors that you might work with as well. Um, when we broke down the good, better, best uh, uh, product groups, we really tried to think of a few different factors as to what would be the best solution to offer. Um, one of the one of the things the first things was uh, um, obviously contact time. Jim spoke about contact time and how that is extremely important, and that you must follow the label of any item that you have when it comes to uh, disinfecting. So, for example, as you can see in the uh, in this uh, present in this uh, slide, uh, for example, under the good column, you'll see a couple of items: uh, Virex two two five six and Crew Restroom. These are two items that we have that are good liquid disinfectants and the contact times for those are 10 minutes. So again, they, in order for you to get uh, the, uh, uh, for, in order for that product to actually do what it's supposed to do, after you clean and rinse first, and then you use a disinfectant, you must leave it there for 10 minutes. Now, in some cases, um, 10 minutes is too long of a time uh, for, for certain customers. They can't wait for 10 minutes before someone, let's say, needs to reuse that dining room table um, or for whatever reason there is. So you can move on to the better um, uh, solution, which is Lysol, a Lysol disinfect, uh, disinfectant spray. Contact time there is four minutes. Best is our Oxivir TV uh, ready to use, which has a one minute contact time. So again, you know, different solutions depending on, uh, on, depending on your needs. Um, another thing that we also take into consideration when looking at good, better, best uh, is also sometimes um, product availability. And this is something that you'll have to have a discussion with your GFS sales rep um, and your diversity rep, if you have a diversity rep as well, to really get a good understanding of what product is available at this time. As you can imagine, the demand on our products right now is really through the roof. I think I saw something the other day where uh, um, the demand that we're seeing is 40 times that of our normal historical performance. So that's how much pressure is being put on from obviously a lot of different businesses and a lot of different sectors when it comes to these products and these uh, disinfectants and sanitizers. Uh, so that's something that you'll have to also discuss to ensure that that product is, uh, is available. Uh, and a third factor that we also try to look at is, you know, recommending uh, ready to use product versus dispense product. And this is something that's also important because some of our customers have our dispensing platforms and they can utilize some of our product that uh, is concentrated and can be hooked up to those dispensers and mixed with water and away you go. In other cases, we might have customers or new customers that don't have those dispensing platforms. So we really need to be uh, ready with a ready to use product for them so that they can get it and get going right away. Okay, uh, I know that uh, Jim has already talked about the difference between disinfecting and sanitizing. So I don't want to really get into that too much anymore because obviously he's more well versed in that uh, and, and has already spoken to it. Uh, but that's also important to understand the difference between a sanitizer and a disinfectant. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of people would rather go to, towards a disinfectant. They feel uh, I don't know, maybe a better peace of mind, let's say, right, Jim? Uh, with a disinfectant versus yep. a sanitizer, uh, and that's obviously to each to each their own. But I know Jim spoke uh, spoke very well in explaining. Sometimes maybe we do go a little bit overboard in certain areas in certain cases. Uh, but I think the bottom line is, if you follow the label, follow the instructions, and really adhere to uh, to that contact time, uh, I think you'll be in good 
in good shape. So again, the proper dwell time is the most important thing here. So um, awesome. this, this is just some information here for you that I wanted to share. Um, and that's uh, about it for me. So Joel and uh, Jim, thank you very much for all that information. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of great information in there, a lot of uh, learning I took away from that. Um, is there a way for an operator that uh, reaching out to their GFS rep where we can share with them kind of that guide, you know, we touched on cleaning what needed to be cleaned. Um, sometimes we're going overboard and time limits. I think it can be overwhelming for operators um, and staff to say, how long do I need to leave this on? Uh, what areas should I be cleaning and when? Cause people want to see cleaning. People want to see gloves. So do you guys have something that we could share out with the teams of, of a breakdown of when and why and timing? Uh, yeah, definitely. We do have some uh, great marketing uh, material, some great guides that some has been shared that I have shared with GFS as well with uh, some of my contacts at GFS who hopefully would share that along to, uh, to the GFS sales team so that they'll have it on, so that they'll have it with them. I do know as well, we have links to our own website um, where um, um, on our own website, diversity.com. If you go on there, there's an actual a specific link dedicated to COVID-19. And there's a lot of great material in there that can really help food service operators uh, with that. Jim, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think um, we've definitely got uh, brochures that are set up specifically for the food service industry, like Suhail said. So I think those, um, if we can provide a link, Suhail, back to yep. GFS. Yep. I'll share one. I'll share with Brett. Well, yeah, so make sure we get that out, out to the people on the call. And this, this question might be more from Melissa, and it's more around um, from what I can see on the employee side. So uh, thinking of the dishwashers in the back, is it, um, is it recommended to have a designated dishwasher since there is splashback during, um, you know, cleaning dishes or they're spraying them down? You know, is it recommended or do you have any advice for folks um, when setting up staffing in the back? Sorry, Jim or Sahel, did you have any thoughts on that? Yep. Um, I went through this in um, healthcare where somebody freaked out one day because a piece of cotton with a small dot of blood made it down into the dishwashing area on a tray. And the whole world imploded. And I sort of went down at the time to find out how our people were tearing down trays that came down from the uh, hospital floors and found out they needed better personal protective equipment all the time. Uh, and I actually brought in on my occupational health and safety person saying, why are these people utilizing a high pressure spray uh, to blow product off of a dish before it goes into the rack to go into the machine without face protection on? They had aprons, but they had no face protection. And so to me, anyone working where there's a chance of stuff getting in their eye, be it a food particle or respiratory secretions from uh, whatever the customer has done to the utensils, they should have their face protected. And I'm, I'm saying just a plain face shield to protect them from that. In terms of the social distancing in the back of house, that becomes a bit bigger of an issue. Again, I've seen some stuff suggesting just having a clear headband face shield on is going to stop respiratory secretion. So if I talk turn to talk to the person next to me. My secretions are going to hit the inside of my shield. Their secretions will hit the inside of their shield. We're probably okay to be closer working together. So I think if we can incorporate some personal protective equipment to protect them from a health and safety perspective, it's also going to stop some transmission that we will see. So no, no need for one specific person as long as you have the right things in place. Awesome. Um, Melissa, there's uh, some questions here around um, legal issues and, and the question brought up um, earlier. Um, what are some of the emerging legal issues for restaurants right now and how should operators be thinking about their liability? Yeah, so right now, <clears throat> I'd say, you know, as provinces are looking at um, opening back up and, you know, phasing through that, um, there could be some liability arising out of restaurants perhaps opening too soon or maybe not within the parameters that are set out by provincial guidelines. So I think that's going to be really important, um, an area where, um, where operators can avoid liability is to really strictly follow those, um, the guidelines set out by provincial, provincial orders, um, whether they be you know, some provinces, there may be some limits on restaurant capacity, you know, requiring that restaurants open dining rooms to only 
25% or 35% or 50%, um, you know, and overwhelmingly, obviously, we've heard operators say that it's not financially feasible and that they would wait until they can open to at least a 50% capacity. So this will have to be, you know, a case-by-case -case sort of decision that operators will make, um, but always in compliance with provincial guidelines. Um, some, you know, uh, provincial orders may require that staff um, be wearing personal uh, protective equipment, like either gloves or face shields or masks. So it's very important to uh, ensure that any sort of um, opening that an operator undertakes is in compliance with those provincial guidelines. Um, and then there's the fact that, you know, once you open, um, there's some liability associated with either one of your having a suspected or confirmed case or maybe a patron um, falling ill um, after you've opened and so unfortunately the law in this area has obviously not evolved as quickly as the virus has um, so you know there could be some so-called exposure cases where there could be allegations that somebody contracted the virus as the result of either action or inaction um, of the business owner this is something that is really being seen as one of the biggest threats to Canadian business uh, post COVID, um, you know, because it impacts really any business in any industry where an employee or a customer uh, may fall ill. Um, and these cases would be brought on a very simple negligence claim. So, um, you know, that involves um, a duty, a breach of that duty, a causation, and then showing damages. So what that means is the person alleging um, exposure and alleging negligence would need to say, basically prove that the restaurant had a duty to provide a safe environment um, and then prove that that duty was breached and then prove that their illness was um, as a result of that breach. And then finally, they'd have to you know, demonstrate what they suffered as a result of that breach. Um, that's why it's you know one of the defenses, I think, to any sort of negligence claim would be the ability to demonstrate that the operator did everything that they could to ensure um, a safe environment. So um, following obviously public health authority guidelines, any sort of provincial requirements, um, demonstrating that employees are trained, um, posting signage, actually, you know, even throughout the restaurant, whether that's about um, signage that promotes physical distancing, whether it's, you know, signs that display um, maximum number of customers in the restaurant at one time. Um, so all of these things are going to be important to demonstrate. It's going to be important to demonstrate that when you are training your employees, how often that's happening. So, you know, document um, safety measures that you're taking, document the training that happens, document sign off from employees that's going to be very important to be able to demonstrate that an operator did everything that they could um, to provide a safe environment to their employees and patrons. Um, you know, one of the challenges with this virus is obviously contract, contact tracing. Um, it's, it's difficult to know, especially in a restaurant environment, uh, who's interacted. I mean, you've got patrons coming in from the general public. Um, so that will be, a challenge. So it'll be important for restaurants to kind of be mindful of creating the sufficient physical distancing, creating, taking the measures that, um, you know, Jim and Suhail were talking about in terms of ensuring that employees are wearing masks or, um, you know, and also demonstrating to the public as well that there's, um, you know, that cleaning is happening on a regular basis. And I, I think, again, tracking those and monitoring those um, will be important. So with, um, with that, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. The one last question came in and we're, we're getting tight on time here. Um, so when you talk about that, you know, explaining that out, what role does communication play and how should operators be thinking about communication um, in light of these issues? Yeah, so I think communication can be really key, um, whether that's communication to your employee about um, safety measures and your expectations as an employer, um, or whether that's communication to your customers about what the expectations are in terms of health and safety while they're within your premises. Um, an example is, you know, right now the general public is extremely freaked out about COVID and, you know, there are lots of people tweeting and posting to social media about businesses that are not 
taking the precautions. I've, I've seen posts about certain you know, local grocery stores that are not taking precautions, and warning the general public against going to that business. Um, this will be really important. Like I think reputational capital is going to play a big part in that communication piece. So we need to build that reputational capital so that if we were to be you know, caught up in an allegation, um, demonstrate that in communicating. Um, I think it's very important to also understand, have a plan in place for how you, if there is a positive, either with an employee or a customer, um, I think it'll depend on a case by case basis, but each operator should really have a plan at the ready on how they're going to get out if there was a positive. Awesome. So we, we are getting tight on time. Um, there is a, still a couple questions out there that um, we will get to. Uh, we will follow up with uh, the individuals. Um, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank our guests uh, for all this excellent information. Um, if you do have other, um, um, and we have your contact info, if you've in, input that information, we will get back to you with the answers. If not, as always, please reach out to your Gordon Food Service rep. Uh, they will get the information to us and we will get you the answers to your questions like always. So Jim, Suhal, uh, Melissa, I want to thank you very much for your time. I appreciate uh, everything you've done for us and we'll make sure we talk to you guys soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.